The sermon for this evening I actually got the idea at the Make America Straight Again conference and it was a sermon that, that Pastor Anderson preached on that Saturday and he made, he made a, really, a really good point in his sermon and I encourage you to listen to it if you didn't get a chance to hear it already. Um, but, but one of the points he made really, really resonated with me. And, and I don't know if you've heard, like Pastor Boyle um, created a really great song for that conference, the Make America Straight Again conference, where he says he will love them no more. And it's just, it's a, it's a song about, about the reprobate doctrine. And it's, I think it's, it's really well put together. And, um, you know, just kind of, it ultimately is a warning, you know, hey, there's a point where God could love you no more, right? Like God, God loves you. He wants you to be saved. He, want, you know, he wants you to receive his son, but there's a point where he's going to love you no more. And that is an important doctrine that, that people just need to understand, you know, worldwide. This false doctrine that just says, well, you always have a chance. All, you could just wait until, you know, you're on your deathbed. Like, no. Like, don't, you, you don't know if you're, I mean, first of all, you don't know when, when you're going to breathe your last breath. But in addition to that, I mean, you, you can't just, just push things too far. And once you've heard the gospel, just reject it and reject it and just think that, oh, well, there's always going to be an opportunity. There's not. So just the, the doctrine itself is important. But the fact that we're singing songs, see, it drives some people nuts. And they think, you know, you might hear complaints saying, oh, well, that's just in really poor taste. And that's, that's not how you, you, you shouldn't be singing songs about it. It's one thing to believe the doctrine. It's another thing to sing songs about it, right? That's just in poor taste. And you're just going to be turning people away. And I can't believe that you would sing about those things. But this is coming from a really ignorant a really ignorant attitude on the scripture and what it teaches. And we're going to be spending a lot of time this evening in the book of Psalms and just remembering the book of Psalms is a songbook. That's right. These are all songs that are found in the book of Psalms and we have a tendency to detach ourselves from that. One, because Psalms aren't really sung in churches anymore. It's something, it's, 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 it's a tradition that's just fallen by the wayside and has just become something of the past. But it's something that we ought to be doing and needs to be brought back. It's something that's very biblical. It's scriptural. Look down in Colossians chapter 3 where we started. The Bible says in verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amen. And this is something, you know, we need, we have hymns. We have a hymn book. And you know what? I love the hymns and I'm not saying to get rid of the hymns because that's one of the things that's mentioned here in this verse. We sing the hymns. We love the hymns. The hymns are great. But if you notice, a lot of the hymns of today, they're very lopsided in general, just on doctrine. I'm not saying we shouldn't be singing, you know, all these hymns that praise the Lord and have mercy and, you know, and, and just the thanksgiving of salvation. I love all those hymns and we need to continue singing those hymns and singing those songs and they're great songs and they're great hymns. But we need a good balance and we ought to be having spiritual songs and psalms. Psalms is the first thing mentioned there. Psalms are the word of God and psalms are songs. They're, they're, they're the word of God put to music. And when it comes to music, music is really powerful. And I preached on this in the past. I'm going to preach on it again. It's not the main thrust of my sermon tonight. But songs are used of God even because they're a powerful tool. And when God wanted, you know, the children of Israel to just remember certain truths, he, he gave Moses a song that he taught to the children of Israel. He says, you know what? When, when years down the road, you know, you're all straying from the word of God and straying from the Lord, you're still going to have this song. Why? Because songs will stick in your head. 
I mean, I have so many of this world songs just stuck in my head and they're not going away. They're there. I've got the lyrics memorized. I could just sit right. I've got the whole song memorized, all the, you know, the notes, the way it sounds. I can have soundtracks just playing in my head over and over and over again because songs are that powerful in the way that they embed themselves in your brain. And it is, a, it is a way to make you memorize things and just hold on to it. It's a fact. That's, just, that's how music works and how the song works. So God has, it's, it's no surprise, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that the biggest book in the entire Bible, the book of Psalms, is a song book. And it also shouldn't surprise us how much doctrine you could find in the Psalms and how important that is. We're supposed to be teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is an important aspect of the Christian life, and this is something that's fallen by the wayside. And we need to get back to that. We need more people who are musically inclined to be able to put these psalms back to music. Because who knows what melodies and, and how they sounded, you know, in generations past. We don't even know. I mean, I don't, as far as I, I don't know anyone that can just say, you know, with, with authority that this is the way it was done, because I don't think anyone really knows. And especially if you go back and how it sounded in Hebrew and things like that, it doesn't matter. I, I don't think God's focused on there has to be a particular one tune or melody that, that has to be played, but we need to be singing God's songs and God's psalms in, uh, in, our, in our congregation, in our service. The Bible says also, Ephesians 5 is kind of a parallel to Colossians chapter 3. Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Um, and then we need to remember, now look, these are two New Testament passages, two, that are specifically telling us that we should be singing psalms and not just singing them as in, well, that just gives praise in the Lord, teaching and admonishing, right? This is doctrine. We should be getting doctrine from here. So you can say, oh, well, Psalms, that's Old Testament. We, as New Testament believers, we don't need to worry about the Old Testament, right? Well, no, in the New Testament, it's saying, hey, teach and admonish each other with Psalms. So, you know, people want to throw away parts of the, the Old Testament and stuff, and we could argue about that, about what parts you want to throw away. I don't have to throw away any of the parts, but... You can't throw away Psalms in the New Testament because we're given clear direction, instruction, teach and admonish one another in Psalms. Okay. Well, then if we're going to get some doctrine from somewhere, I think Psalms is going to be a great place. And so much so, these things are so important, God wants them in our memory. He wants us to remember these things because that's why they're in the form of a psalm. So that's going to stay with us. These are important truths that are going to help guide us and teach us in this life. And unfortunately, in, in our music, in our worship of God, whether it be music, in the teaching that we do through our songs, it's very lopsided. And I think that this points now to one of the problems that's allowed Christianity to get where it is now because we've gotten a little bit too lopsided on, the one, on just the mercy and the love of God and not getting the full picture that we could find in the book of Psalms. Turn to Psalm 101. And of course, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. This is why we take the, whole, the Bible as a whole. We, we don't just throw out, you know, two thirds of the Bible that's in the Old Testament just because it's Old Testament. We, you know, it's all the word of God. It's all given by inspiration of God and it's all profitable. So we're going to go to all of it, including the Psalms, but the Psalms specifically are mentioned twice saying, hey, teach with the Psalms. Okay, well then let's do that. Psalm 101, we're going to spend the rest of the evening in, just in the book of Psalms. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to end up just belaboring this point, but I think it just needs to be done at least once to get a proper view, because we can't go through all 150, so, you know, we're not going to go through every single psalm tonight. That would be a little ridiculous. But um, 
you should be reading these on your own and, and studying and looking at it and memorizing and, you know, and, and going to Psalms for Doctrine on your own. But I'm going to highlight particular Psalms where we're supposed to be getting teaching from that I feel has just been neglected when it comes to the singing in, in our services. Psalm 101, verse number 1 reads, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. We have the mercy down. I think we've got that pretty good. And obviously that's important. And I'm not going to try to understate the importance of mercy. Yes, it's the, the mercy of God that, that even allows us to be saved. Praise the Lord. It's something to rejoice about and be happy about. But you know what? I am also supposed to, we're all supposed to love the law of the Lord. We're supposed to love his ways. He's got the right way. He's got the right path. We should love that and exalt God for that and, and try to follow that. We also need to be singing about judgment. Now, why are both important? Well, if you're, if you're hearing songs, if you're being brought up in church, if you're being brought up in a culture of church and you're hearing songs and maybe, you know, kids are growing up and they're not saved for whatever reason, other people come in, they hear it. The songs are going to stick with you. You can't just hear one side of the story. You need to hear both. You need to hear about the judgment. When we go out soul winning, do we only preach mercy? No, we preach judgment too. We have to show people, they have to understand they're on their way to hell. And without Christ, there's a punishment, there's a judgment coming, and they need to be aware of that. And even just the world at large needs to understand that there's judgment. We don't live in a fantasy world. You reap what you sow. Judgment happens. It's truth. And thank God for that truth, but we need to make sure that we don't just build a fantasy world that's completely lopsided. We need a full picture. And part of that picture is judgment. People these days have gone so weirdo on, on this concept, it's almost like there are no more bad people in the world. Yeah. I mean, that's just kind of where we're headed. It's everything's just an excuse as to, well, this person's this way, this person, you know. No, there are wicked people. There's good, there's evil. There's good and bad. There's both. And we need to hear about it. We need to hear that, you know what, there's judgment. And there's going to be consequences for things. And even if you're saved, hey, there's judgment. There's mercy and there's judgment. And when you live your life, these psalms ought to be ringing through our heads when we make decisions, when we teach our children, every aspect of our life, this ought to be ingrained in our heads. And we need to have the full picture. So let's continue in... in you know, with Psalm 101, I brought this up just a week ago. I was talking about the Pharisees, right? He says, I will sing of mercy and judgment. And what do people want to call us? The Pharisees, right? But what did Jesus say? Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of men and innocent human, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. So he's saying they've omitted the mercy and the judgment. That's the Pharisee. They've omitted these things. The Psalms are saying, hey, we're going to sing of both. Mercy and judgment. We need both. Uh, let's keep going in Psalm 101. Look at verse number 2. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. This is a song. Imagine singing this as a song. And what's interesting, though, is that all of our hymns, like, is there a hymn that even uses the word hate? I don't know. I mean, I, I, not, not one that's commonly sung. It, there, there may be one. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if there is one. But how many times is the word hate used in the book of Psalms? I mean, it is used over and over again. We're going to see that. But even just the, the, the lack of that one word has an influence on the way that you think. Certain subjects is being left out and we're only hearing one side and only focus on one thing creates an imbalance. We are instructed to sing the Psalms. They will stay with us. 
I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. This is, this, this is going to go to how you live your life. If you've got a song ringing in your head, yeah, I will not know a wicked person, you know, however a tune is going to go, right? And look, I'm not good at making up songs, so <laughs> you'll probably hear a few more of those tonight. You can laugh at me. I, it's okay. Um, I am not that musically inclined on, on being able to create music. But however the tune would go in your head, you know, I'm not going to know a wicked person. We need that. Because you don't want to just be going soft on, on the wickedness, on the wicked. Like, we, we just can't start getting this real, tender, soft attitude against all unrighteousness to the point where we're just like, you know, just overly filled with mercy above the mercy of God. When our mercy exceeds the mercy that God extends, we're out of balance. We're out of line. We ought to be able to follow. And look, God's real heavy on the mercy. He's very long-suffering. So don't get me wrong here, because, <laughs> but we, we just cannot lose out on the rest of the teaching. We can't. I mean, if he's singing, I'm not going to know a wicked person, that's a good thing. That, that teaches you who, who should be your... Who are the people that you know? Who are the people that you're friends with and that you're spending time with? If they're a real wicked person, well, a psalm like this, if it's ringing in your head and you're hearing it at church and stuff, make you think about those things. And sometimes, you know, what songs will make you do, they'll make you think about things just subconsciously. You're not even actively really thinking about it, but when you hear the song, you have a tendency to do things. I know for the long, you know, I was in the world music for a long time and something that my flesh really craved. And even though for a long time I kind of knew it was wrong, I'd still delve back into it. Every time that I would allow myself, as a believer, to get back into the rock and roll, the music that I liked, and just kind of gave in to my flesh, it always followed with other sins. And those sins would always be ones that are referenced in the songs. So you're exposing yourself to this stuff, and and it's something because you think you could just play around with this a little. Oh, I'm just going to listen to a little bit. Oh, I'm just going to gratify my flesh a little bit. I like the way it sounds. I like the song. I don't want it. You go back to that and here you go again. Now all of a sudden you're doing this and doing that or whatever, you know. It has an impact. It, ha it impacts what you do. Whether you realize or not, whether you want to recognize or not, it's true. P music's powerful. Verse number five here, it says, uh, Whoso privily, privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. I don't have anything to do with that guy. You're, you're, you're secretly just slandering people. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart, will not I suffer. I'm not going to allow these people to be around me. These are great teachings and life lessons through a psalm of how you ought to be living your life. And you sing these songs over and over again. It's going to just help be cemented in your, in your mind. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Hey, that's a great verse to just have be reminded of. Judgment's coming. There is a judgment. It's part of the Bible. It, 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 we need to remember these things. One, I mean, hey, that could be a good motivator. Judgment's coming. Let's reach more people. There's a judgment coming. People need to hear about it. It kind of puts a little bit of fire behind just the cause in general. I know I should go soul winning. You got this plan in your head. Hey, judgment's coming. Let's get moving. Flip back to Psalm 1. There's no way, I'll tell you right now, there's no way I'm going to have time to go through all these psalms like I wanted to. We're going to go to, my plan, because I have all these written down, is to look at Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 5, Psalm 9, Psalm 10, Psalm 11, 26, 28, 35, 52, 55, 58, 59, 68, 69, 109, and 139. And I left out a bunch. <laughs> 
for sake of time. <laughs> These are ones I'm cherry picking. <laughs> okay? Just full disclosure. Because I want to just go through it. We're just going to read through them. I'm, I'm not necessarily going to expound a whole lot on them. But just don't forget, these are songs. These are songs. These are things that we should be singing in church, singing at home, singing and just having the Word of God that we could meditate on, teaching doctrine, teaching one another in Psalms. Let's start with Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. How about that to be a very good reference about the law of God? People want to scoff at, oh, the, the law, the, you mean the Old Testament law? Oh, you, and it drives me nuts when you have Christians today. Well, don't you know that the, like, what are you going to do? Put a disobedient child to death and just mocking at the word of God. Like, I thought you were supposed to believe the Bible. Amen. What's the matter with you? You're going to use the same arguments that an atheist uses. Shame on you if you call yourself a Christian and you're going to mock the law of the Lord. The Bible says, my delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law doth I meditate day and night. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be focused on that. I love it. And you're not going to say the stupid things that aren't even true. It's not like, Oh, so if your child talks back to you, you're going to put him to death? That's not what the Bible teaches right. at all, not even close. Good. And I'm not going to get off into that tonight. Let's keep reading here. Verse number three. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. Again, imagine a singing voice. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Their way is going to die. It's going to go away. But the way of the righteous is going to stand forever. We need to be reminded of that. Righteousness is the way to go. You, it's easy to get deceived sometimes by the, by the prosperity of the wicked, the supposed prosperity. Psalms will help keep us in line. Look at, look at Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet if I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Look at verse number nine. Again, a song. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Imagine if Psalm 2 was like on the pop charts, <laughs> right? And that this is the most popular song of the week. Casey Kasem's Top 40 is his number one. Psalm 2 for the 10th week in a row. <laughs> hey, praise God. Look at all the truth that's in this. If, you could, if this is just, you know, it's, it's saying, beware, kings, beware, rulers. Why? Because of judgment. Do what's right. I mean, real basic principles of right and wrong. Look at Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. A reference to a holy God. There is no pleasure in the wickedness at all. 
It's, it's pretty stark contrast. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. There's a teaching that God hates all workers of iniquity. If this is being sung in Baptist churches across the world, maybe people wouldn't freak out when they hear the reprobate doctrine, when, when the most vile people in the world are being called out for being animals, for being dogs, for being brute beasts, Amen. maybe they wouldn't freak out so much if they have had the Psalms playing over and over again in their minds. Amen. Oh, this actually matches up with what the Psalms are teaching me about wicked people. Verse 6, Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. There's the mercy. Hey, these wicked, bloody people that are murdering the innocent, that are just out to destroy, you know what? They're going to have judgment, but as for me, I'm going to seek your mercy. And humbly, look at it, I'm going to go to you in fear and, and come into the house of mercy. These guys are not that way. And there are people like that out there. And this is, you're going to see this dichotomy all the time through all these psalms. Going through. There's really wicked people, there's really bad people out there that hate God, who have nothing to do with them, and then there's people that fear God. Ones that fear God are the ones that receive the mercy, and the ones that hate God are the ones that don't. And judgment is coming, and judgment is there, and judgment is real, and we need to remember the judgment. But we're told not to judge. <laughs> I'm not the one casting them into hell. But if I tell you that God's going to, you can call me whatever you want. This That doesn't change what the book says. If you're, if you're going to say it's my judgment, then you're just fooling yourself because you want to hate the messenger when you really just hate the message itself. You really hate the author. Verse number eight, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. This is a psalm. Destroy thou them, O God. How dare you? If you were to put this to music and sing it in a church, people would freak out. You're, you're singing a song that God would destroy somebody? <gasps> That's horrible. That's terrible. You know that's true. You know that would be the vast majority of people out there today would have that type of, I can't believe, we shouldn't be doing that. We should not be saying that. Don't you know that, that God's not happy with the, with the death of the wicked? Look, I'm not saying that God wants everybody dying out of hell. The Bible says, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but they all should come to repentance. But the fact is that there's some people that... that have already made their, made their bed. They've already rejected the Lord. And God's removed his love from them. Right. It's not that he never wanted them to be saved. He wanted them to be saved. But they've, they've crossed the line. And judgment's coming. And you know what? Destroy them. Destroy them, O oh God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. For they have rebelled against thee. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Do you see the balance? And as you go through the Psalms, you'll see more of that. Now, obviously, we don't want to have an attitude where we just think that we're better than everybody. Right, and prevent ourselves from having any dealings with anybody just because, oh, you all are sinners and we're perfect. And, you know, no, it's not a holier than thou. It's not even what's being taught here. Because what you're going to find is that 
this is always talking about what the Bible refers to as the wicked. You start seeing these attributes of people, these haters of God. These are, these are reprobate people. When it says that their, their inward part is very wickedness and their throat is an open sepulcher, this is also used to describe the Pharisees, these false prophets, that their, their throat was an open sepulcher. They're full of dead men's bones inside. These are people that are twice dead. These are children of the devil. They flatter with their tongue. They're just out to deceive people. Turn to Psalm uh, 9. Psalm 9. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou saddest in the throne, judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. This is a song. This is being sung about these wicked people being destroyed. Oh, you shouldn't rejoice. In the Should we be singing the Psalms? Is this under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost? Is Psalm 9 the Word of God? Or should we rip it out of our Bibles and cast it out as just the Word of man? I think, I think this is the Word of God. And I'm, I'm going to trust that this is right and your feeling is wrong. If you think that, that this is just so horrible that anyone would sing a song like this. O thou enemy, verse 6, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities, their memorial has perished with them, but the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made, and the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Hegayon, Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God song the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God for the needy shall not always be forgotten the expectation of the poor shall not perish forever arise O Lord let not man prevail let the heathen be judged in thy sight put them in fear O Lord that the nations may know themselves to be but men this is asking God to bring his judgment because we need men to fear God and understand, hey, you're only men. You're not gods. No matter how much power you think you have as a ruler of a country, you're not a god. You need to be brought down. And this psalm is literally a psalm unto God, asking God to just, hey, judge these people. And let the heat, let's make sure that they know, God, that you're in charge. Let them know that you're all powerful, that you're almighty. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a right attitude to have. And there's nothing wrong about singing about it either. Psalm 10. Let's keep going here. Psalm 10. Why standest thou far off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. Now look, this is reality. I mean, this is like Proverbs. This is, this is, this is real life. There are wicked people out there that are prideful and they persecute the poor. And again, these is, this is educational. You hear songs like this. This is songs about re real life. There's a lot to be learned from the Psalms, which is a reason why I think we, we really need to, to, to work hard, I think, to bring these back into 
our music into our song. And I'm not, and not just the ones I'm referencing, all of them. Let's get the full picture. Let's not become imbalanced. The reason I'm pointing these out is just because all, all of this stuff is just completely not included in any of the hymns that we sing. And it's nothing bad about the hymns that we sing. It's just this, it, we're missing this. Verse number three, for the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. God hates the wicked that blesses covetous people. The, the wicked that is lifted up in his own heart's desire and then also has pleasure in them that do it also. Not only does he himself, but he has pleasure in them that do it. That's from Romans 1. And that's describing the same type of wicked person. He said, yeah, he boasts of his own heart's desire and he blesses other covetous people. Verse 4, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. More judgment. Verse 6, he hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. These are some pretty good warnings about these wicked people and what they do. And when this is committed to music and sung, you're going to be reminded of this. And this is important because naturally, as human beings, we have a tendency to project who you are on other people. So if you're a pretty decent person, you're not laying traps for people, you're not trying to hurt people, you have a tendency to think, well, that's how everybody is. That's how I think, you know, I'm not like planning and plotting to hurt someone and devise mischief and do all this stuff. So why would I think anyone else is doing that? That's just weird. That's out there. Singing about this stuff is going to put that into your mind. Hey, be aware. There's people out there. Look out for them. This is real. And we need that constant reminder. Verse number 10, He croucheth and humbleth himself in the poor, that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it with thy hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. Great song. That's, that's one I'd like to see put the music for sure. Let's, um, I'm, I'm going to have to skip. I, I knew this was going to happen, but I wrote all these down. Write them down and read them later so that you can just, just get the full picture for yourself. Um, I think I'm just going to go to the ones I actually have printed in my notes. That's plenty. I'm going to skip Psalm 11, I'm going to skip Psalm 26, Psalm 28, Psalm 35, and Psalm 52. I'm going to skip them. Go to Psalm 55. So you want to read them later. That's 11, 26, 28, 35, 52. Or you know what? Just read the whole book of Psalms. <laughs> and you get the full picture. Yep. But all of these that I chose, they, just, they have references to wicked people. They have references to just... God's judgment coming on them. And this isn't just a really small, this isn't like one psalm, right, where God's talking about hating someone. This isn't one psalm where you can say, well, I don't know. You know, I mean, everything else is contrary to that. But this one, this is just all throughout, you're going to find the book of Psalms. There's mercy and there's judgment. 
I mean, otherwise Psalm 101 1 wouldn't be true. I will sing of mercy and judgment. If, if you never found judgment in any of the Psalms, then you'd be like, well, what do you mean you're singing of mercy and judgment? You're only singing about mercy. No, he's singing about the whole picture. So, of course, you're going to find it throughout Scripture. Psalm 55, we're going to start reading in verse number 9. The Bible reads, Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go about it upon the walls thereof. Mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it. Wickedness is in the midst thereof. Deceit and guile depart not from her streets. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. This is a great warning of the people who creep in privily unawares. That, that you know, feast with you. And they have eyes that cannot cease from sin. Eyes full of adultery. Sporting themselves as they feast with you. This is a perfect example of that. And when you have the psalm, just make you aware. Let's keep reading here because this is, look at verse 15. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. How, did, how could you possibly sing a song that says, let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell? Because there are people where that is righteous and that is the right attitude to have. And that's a fact. If it wasn't a fact, God wouldn't have included that in his psalms to be singing about that, about people being cursed and dying to just go down quickly into hell. I hope that all these pedophiles and perverts that are out there, I hope they would all die tonight and just go straight to hell. And just stop defiling people and that God's judgment would just come quick upon them. Because there's no hope for them anyway. They've already been rejected of God. I just wish that that would happen and just happen quickly. And that's a righteous attitude to have. That's why we find it in the Bible. And if people were singing the Psalms, it wouldn't be so crazy. We wouldn't get news coverage. Wow, here's someone who actually believes the Bible. Look at this. This just in. Do -do 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 Baptist Church found in Georgia. They actually believe the Bible. It should be commonplace. And if people, I mean, one, people aren't even reading the Bible. But God knew that was going to happen. And that's why he introduced these psalms for songs to, to just get in people's heads. Because people still, even though they don't read the Bible, they still go to church. A lot of people out there will just go to church every week. It just becomes a habit. It becomes a routine. Yeah, hey, we should go to church. Church is good. If you're just hearing these songs over and over again, that will influence the way that you think. It does. It does influence you. Let's keep read, uh, Let's jump down to verse number 19. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old, Selah, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil. Yet, they, yet were they drawn swords. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. It's a good description. Let's go to, um, let's go to Psalm 69. We'll spend a little bit of time in Psalm 69. So again, I'm, I'm passing up Psalm 58, Psalm 59, and Psalm 68. Okay? I gave myself too much to go through in one evening. All right? We'd be here probably all night if, I was just, if we just went through all these uh, verse by verse. 
But how about Psalm 69? And, and what's really interesting about Psalm 69 and other psalms as well, Psalm 69 is, is very prophetic. Psalm 69 has a lot of references to Jesus Christ being on the cross. And when this is written from the point of view of the person on the cross, this is going to get you into the mind of Jesus Christ on the cross and his attitude. And just as, um, you know, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, and, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch is, is reading that passage in Isaiah, and he's like, well, what does a prophet mean here? Is he speaking of himself or some other man? He already knows that as a prophet of God, you know, David isn't always referring to himself, that being a prophet, he's speaking of other things or of other people. And, you know, uh, in that particular passage, it was talking about Jesus Christ as a lamb, uh, you know, done before sheer. And, and, and it's just a reference. So that's not talking about that person who's writing it. That's talking about Jesus. And when we read here in Psalm 69, look at, look at verse 21 is where we're going to start reading. They gave me, so this is the, like the narrator of the, of the psalm, they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. That's exactly what they did when Jesus was hanging out on the cross. He says, I thirst, and they're giving them vinegar to drink. Right? right? Look what he says in verse 22. Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. This is cursing, and we're going to keep reading. Now, mind you, Jesus had mercy and judgment because he said on one hand, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. About the Roman soldiers who just, they were following orders or put them up there. They were in sin. It was wicked. They shouldn't have done that. But he's basically saying, you know what? They're ignorant. They don't know what they do. But the Pharisees that plotted and, and conspired and lied about him to have him up on the cross and are just reviling him because they just want him dead and they're wicked people and they're children of the devil. These are the people. They're the ones that are adding the insult to injury. They're the ones that are going, oh, you want a drink here? We'll give you some vinegar and just make you suffer a little bit more. These are unmerciful and implacable people. Amen. That's why they're receiving such a curse from Jesus Christ, the one who, is, who came to seek and to save that which was lost, and whose goal was that the world might be saved through him, that had the best heart as far as saving people. Here we're getting a look into what's going on as he's on that cross. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually shake. Verse 24, pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents for they persecute him whom thou hast smitten and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Reprobate. Amen. When your name is blotted out of the book of life, you cannot have it added again. It's gone. Done. Blotted out. Your name was going to be there. Nope. Yep. Not there. Done. Removed. That's what he's talking about. And, and this is a song. It's not very loving. No, it's not. And it's reality. And that's why we need to hear it. Because not everything in life is going to make you feel good. Amen. But we need to know about it. It's truth. It's God's word. And if this was being sung, and in our hearts, and in our minds more, again, it would help us to have a balanced mindset. It would help to teach us this doctrine and, and guide us in the right way through the Word of God, just being in our minds. It's going to lead you right. Last place we'll turn, well, turn to Psalm 109, please. There's two more I was going to look at. I skipped a lot. 
I skipped a lot. Uh, we're not going to read the whole psalm. Psalm 109, though, this talks about the curse on Judas. Okay? And again, think about the narrator. Think about who, who this is applied to. This is a song. This is being sung, and it's a curse. It is a cursing. It's not a blessing. It's not good. It's not good for Judas. There are people out there that this is righteous, and this is the right thing. Look at verse number one. Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked. And I mean, did you notice how much that's referenced in that term, the wicked? You'll notice the term the wicked being referenced in Proverbs as well. It's, it's this specific group of people that's referred to as the wicked. That doesn't mean that a saved person can't do a wicked sin. That doesn't mean that there's not wickedness that could be done by, by everybody. But it's, it's a term that's being applied to a specific group of people that's, that's referred to as the wicked. And as you read the scripture, you're gonna, it's, it's going to more and more clearly identify who these people are as you read through and take it as a whole. Read it all in context and see, well, wow, every time, do your word study on it when the Bible says the wicked. We got great tools to be able to do that stuff now. There's all kinds of platforms and online Bibles and things like that and you can put in your search terms. Do the work for yourself. Do the studying. Seek it out. Every time the term the wicked is used, put them in quotes, say the exact term, the wicked. Read all the verses about it and see if you could figure out what it's talking about. And put that in context with the whole rest of the Bible. This is a specific group of people that are, that are extremely wicked. I believe it's talking about reprobates. So here we see, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful, verse number two, are open against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love, they are my adversaries. But I give myself unto prayer. He said, look, I'm trying to do what's right. I'm trying to love, and they're my enemies because of my love. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. Someone that's going to be like that, that's going to have hatred for the love of Christ, that's going to reward evil when he's just trying to do good, that's a wicked person. That is not your average unbeliever out there that's just bent on being an adversary to everything that's good, to everything that's righteous. No. It's a different type of person, and that's the person who's worthy of the cursing that we're going to see here. Verse number seven, when he shall be judged, let him be condemned. And let his prayer become sin. It's pretty strong. <coughs> I didn't write this. <laughs> I can't take any credit for this at all. But this is right. And this is a song. And we could put happy music to it. Because the law of the Lord is my delight. And why not? Let's, let's keep reading here. I, I, we ju we're just barely getting started in the psalm, and I'm not even going to read the whole thing. And you can read the whole thing. There's a lot there. Look at verse number 8. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Well, that's referenced in the New Testament. We know exactly who this is talking about. His bishopric shall, shall another, another take. Read the book of Acts. Verse number 9. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Well, that's a curse. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let the stranger spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. Neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. This is a strong curse. This is the word of God. We can't overlook these things. This is the truth. This is reality. Amen. It should motivate you in multiple ways. 
we shouldn't ever want anyone to get to this point, but there are people who are at that point. And I think the mind of the Holy Spirit, I think the mind of God, I think that God's word is, is demonstrating what's right in his eyes. Who are you to be more loving than God? And say, no, 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 we shouldn't, we shouldn't. We shouldn't sting, sing about not extending mercy unto Judas. Of course not. Hey, we, I mean, we should be doing all we can to give him the gospel. We should be singing about that. Well, in this psalm, God's saying no. God didn't send the angels to Sodom and Gomorrah to preach the gospel unto them. It's a fact. It's a fact. There's a point in everybody's life where it's not too late for them. And before it's too late, before they become reprobate, God wants them all to be saved. And they, you know, they, we ought to be preaching the gospel to all of them. But at, after that point, let there be none to extend mercy unto them. Verse 13, let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. And we can go on and on and on. I'm just going to turn to one last psalm. Turn to Psalm 139. Read the rest of that psalm later. It goes on. I just, I mean, just for sake of time, I'm not going to keep going on. And we skipped all those other ones. You can read them up. <coughs> Sometimes things are just so obvious, yet we completely just don't see it. So I was really glad I went to that conference. I heard that sermon. I'm just thinking like, oh, this answers so much about the state of affairs, and it's so obvious, and it can read over this stuff over and over again, and I'm thinking like, why don't we sing the Psalms? Look at quote. You know, singing and singing with uh, under the sounds of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in their hearts to the Lord. And you hear that all the time. It's like, yeah, that's a great verse, and you know, and and you apply it just to singing unto the Lord. And it's right in front of our faces, singing psalms. Well, why aren't we singing the psalms? It's something the Bible's telling us to do. Just because it's it's lost its way, let's get back. You read through the Book of Kings and Chronicles, and you know. You see where the children of Israel, they were given everything that's right, just as we have today. I mean, we got the whole Bible. But when things fall out of being a tradition of, of the right, you know, good, godly, right traditions, it, it, sometimes it just takes a really long time for people to just, <laughs> hey, it's right there. I think it was, I think it was with King Hezekiah when he held that the Passover or one of the feasts, and it, it was the, the they were supposed to be um, making booths for themselves during the sacrifice, which is like little like tents or whatever. Like supposed to come out of their habitation and like make these booths, and that was part of the of the ritual, part of what they would do, and that hadn't been done. In like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, yet they all had the Bible, and there's still some men of God that would try to lead righteously and stuff, but that was just overlooked by all of them. And then it's finally just like, hey, let's do this. And it's like, the Bible records it. This wasn't done like since the time of Moses. Like when they first got it, they did it, and then it just was forgotten, yet it was there clearly. You just read, read the scripture, it's right there. And, and, and this is kind of like one of those things. It's so plain. It's so simple. Yeah, we, we definitely should be singing the Psalms. 
There's no question about that. I mean, that's in black and white. I don't think there, there's no doubt in my mind this is right. Like, yeah. And now that just goes to just show, oh, wow. By not doing this, by not following the word of God in this manner, it results, it has a lot of other repercussions that you know, people are just ignorant on now a lot of core doctrine because we weren't following God's simple plans and his simple instructions the way they're written. Well, let's fix that. Amen. Psalm 139, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a song. That's singing. That's something we're supposed to be doing. And you know what? Tonight, thankfully, I, and I don't know who's, if Faithful Word is the one who put the tune to, to this part of Psalm 139, uh, but we have, we're going to sing that tune. Who, whoever came up with the melody and stuff, we're going to sing that tonight. It's going to be our last song that we sing. And I'm going to do my best to try to get more psalms that are put to music incorporated in our church service Amen. because it's the right thing to do. That's right. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take me to try to do that. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to be focused on doing this. This is something that, that is new, that's newer to me. Okay, I'll admit, I'm not perfect. <laughs> but when I see something in Scripture and it's just clear and obvious and this is right, I'm going to, okay, let's do that. And no one, no one told me to do this. I just, I heard he was, you know, preaching on whatever, on, on these different things. And, and it's just like, oh, yeah, we, we, ought, we really ought to be doing this. This is something that, uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. It really is. Like, like the truth always is. When you, when you learn some new truth in Bible, I, I, I don't know how many times I've had this, you're reading or, or you hear a sermon, you hear something just like, Oh man, how did I not see that for all, you know, all these years of reading the Bible and it's just right there, right in front of my face and you just don't see it. It's, uh, it's very clear. So, I really want to have the right attitude that I ought to have as a Christian, as a believer, in every aspect. I don't want to lose love. I don't want to lose mercy, long-suffering, forgiveness at all. Not at all. And we're not going to, we're not phasing out any of that. We've got that, we've got that in, our, in our service and our work and everything that, you know, and what we're doing. But let's just have the full picture. And this one particular psalm that we're going to sing tonight, that's put the music, we're not going to be singing this every single week. This isn't something that's just going to be like, just we're getting beat over the head with and getting imbalanced. But it is going to be just part of our singing. And I'm going to, like I said, we're going to try to get other psalms and just get as much as we can incorporated with our hymns. Right? We'll sing hymns, we'll sing psalms, and I don't know, I'll try to find some spiritual songs to sing too to go along with that, right? Because um, let's, have, let's have a full bounce. Let's follow the, God's word the way that it's written. I don't want to be a hypocrite. If that's what it's saying to do, let's do it. Amen. That's right. have a word of prayer. Dear God, uh, uh, we love you. That's why we're gathered here together. And, and I pray that you would please just continue to open up our understanding from your words, Lord. Sometimes, you know, we learn some real basic, simple truths that could almost make us feel stupid, Lord. And I, and I thank you for, for being long-suffering and merciful with us. And just pray that you would continue to, to open up our understanding and help us to do what's right. Guide us in the right path, Lord. We want to do what's right by you, which is why we're, we're, we're studying your words, dear God. Help us to, to do what's right. Help us to, um, in our endeavor, to, to put your psalms to music, 
that we can incorporate them in our service here, Lord, and that we can receive what you would have us to receive from, from learning and singing these great scriptures, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.